Good afternoon, everybody. I have a couple of uh, announcements before we get started. Uh, the first is, uh, the United States condemns in the strongest possible terms the heinous murder of Palestinian teenager Mohammed Hussein Abu Qader. We send our condolences to his family and to the Palestinian people. We note that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has called upon law enforcement authorities to work as quickly as possible to identify the perpetrators and motives behind this heinous act, and we hope to swiftly see the guilty parties brought to justice. We call on the government of Israel and the Palestinian Authority to take all necessary steps to prevent an atmosphere of revenge and retribution. People who undertake acts of vengeance will only destabilize an already volatile and emotional situation. The second uh, thing I wanted to mention at the top is uh, this morning the President uh, telephoned King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. Uh, you'll note that on uh, previous occasions, early in the Ramadan season, the President has offered uh, his best wishes to the King. Uh, we'll have a more formal readout of that call a little later today. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to discuss with you a report that was issued by our Council uh, of Economic Advisors this morning, and I think we have a little graphic. Uh, on this that we'll put up. Uh, the CEA uh, released a report showing the economic and health benefits of expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. To date, 26 states have chosen to do the right thing by expanding coverage, and in those states, 5.2 million Americans have gained access to affordable health care through Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program, all at no cost to those states. No cost this year, no cost next year, and no cost the year after that. Uh, in the years beyond, uh, it would cost those states no more than 10 percent uh, of the total tab of providing this kind of care. That's why governors of both parties across the country decided to put their people ahead of politics and expand Medicaid in their states. Uh, with today's report, we can see the opportunities that other states are missing. For example, if the remaining 24 states expanded Medicaid, 5.7 million Americans, I'm sorry, 5.7 fewer Americans would be uninsured. Did I say that right? 5.7 million fewer Americans would be uninsured. Uh, 800,000 fewer people would have to borrow money to pay bills or skip a payment entirely in order to pay medical bills. 650,000 more people would receive all the care they feel they need in a typical year. Uh, and, notably, 85,000 more jobs would have been created in 2014 alone. So some governors and state legislators in the 24 uh, state legislatures in the 24 states that have blocked Medicaid expansion face a central consequential decision. They can either score short-term political points by continuing to attack the Affordable Care Act and block the expansion of Medicaid, or they can boost their state's economy, save their state's taxpayers' money, and ensure that thousands of their citizens have access to quality, affordable health care. As today's report shows, it shouldn't be a very difficult choice, and we hope the remaining states will take action without delay to expand these benefits to their state and their citizens. So with that long wind-up, Julie, do you want to get us started with questions? Thanks. I, I want to go back to the situation in the Middle East. Um, mm -hmm. Is it the U.S.'s assessment that the death of this Palestinian teenager was the result of an act of revenge or retaliation for the deaths of the Israeli teens? Uh, it's a good question. The, this, on, on, this investigation is still ongoing, so I, I wouldn't want to get ahead of uh, the investigation that's currently being conducted by uh, law enforcement authorities over there. Uh, we are certainly uh, interested in the, de in the details they uncover uh, about who exactly is responsible for this despicable act. Um, but and typically you wouldn't, I don't want, I don't want to minimize uh, this teenager's death, but typically the U.S. wouldn't put out uh, statements from the White House or Secretary Kerry on uh, just an isolated murder of a teenager. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you if you have an assessment that this is in fact related to what we've seen with the Israeli teens. Uh, we don't have an assessment yet because with, there is an ongoing investigation, so I wouldn't want to get ahead of it. But uh, you heard me, when asked about this yesterday, I expressed our concern uh, that this is a very volatile situation that could devolve into a more violent and destabilizing uh, environment. Uh, and that is something that, uh, that we want to prevent. 
uh, it certainly is in the interests of both sides, both the Palestinians and the Israelis, to prevent. It's in neither of their best interests. Uh, I would note that there continues to be ongoing security cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government. Uh, and I certainly want to, um, uh, you know, the United States certainly would encourage both sides to remain engaged uh, in that cooperation. Uh, I, w I would also point out that we've also seen statements from people like Prime Minister Netanyahu who said earlier today that uh, people should not take the law into their own hands. So we want to see um, both sides acting responsibly uh, to this situation to ensure that it doesn't uh, spiral out of control and lead to even further uh, tragic violence. Has President Obama reached out to Netanyahu or Abbas and does he have any plans to do that if he hasn't already? Uh, I don't have any calls to read out uh, at this point uh, or any calls to give you uh, uh, an indication that we're planning. But uh, as, we, um, you know, as we consider calls like that, we always have a discussion about whether to read them out. And um, uh, if we're in a position to do so, I'll, I'll make sure that you guys uh, are informed. If I could switch over to the meeting with economists today, this is the second such meeting that the President's had in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if his goal in these meetings is to get ideas for short-term executive actions that he can take, or is he looking for their, their take on broader trends, more historical data? Uh, you know, the, the, the top item on the President's domestic policy-making agenda is expanding economic opportunity for the middle class. Uh, and this President has put forward a, a large number of ideas uh, that would demonstrably improve uh, the ability of middle class families to make ends meet. Uh, to succeed and to pursue the American dream and to do the kinds of things that we want middle class families to be able to do, to save money for a house, to save money to send their kids to college and to save money for retirement. So the President's put forward a lot of ideas, uh, many of which have been blocked by Republicans in Congress, unfortunately. Uh, the President is also interested in having an ongoing conversation uh, and he's willing to consider new ideas uh, that others may have. Uh, for accomplishing this goal of expanding economic opportunity for everybody in America. Uh, and so the, the President is having lunch today where I think he'll have a pretty open-ended conversation uh, about what trends they're seeing in the broader economy uh, and uh, ideas they have for policies that could capitalize on those trends to benefit middle class families here in this country. Okay. Jeff? Josh, following up on that, was this the first time that the President has seen or spoken to Ben Bernanke since he stepped down from being Fed Chair? That is a good question. I don't recall off the top of my head a previous conversation between them, so that may be, uh, that may in fact be the case. And aside from sort of the general middle class themes that you just discussed with Julie, can you tell us a little bit more about what specifically they are or did discuss? Well, I think that they're having that lunch right now. Um, we will see if we can get you a little bit of a readout of that launch. I can't guarantee that we will. But um, you know, this, is, this is an opportunity for the President to, um, to hear from them. These are, these are people who come from a variety of perspectives, uh, who aren't constrained by politics in terms of their, uh, their thinking. And the President's interesting in, interested in tapping into some, uh, some of these new ideas that uh, in addition to the ideas that he's already put forward, have the potential to benefit middle class families all across the country. And um, you know, I, I expect it to be uh, uh, the kind of conversation that the President looks forward to. There's a reason we're doing it twice in two weeks. All right. And then two other quick topics on sure. the Abdullah call. Did he, did the President raise the subject of oil supplies on that call? Uh, we'll have a form, more formal readout uh, of that call later today. Uh, I haven't gotten a full download, to be candid with you, about uh, all of the topics that were covered in that phone call. And then lastly, what was the President's reaction to the World Cup yesterday? Uh, that's a good question. I, uh, some of you who were in the pool yesterday had the opportunity to see the President uh, display his excitement about the performance of the, uh, of the American soccer team. Uh, the, I, I think we can all agree that while the outcome wasn't what we'd hoped for, um, that, that the U.S. men's national soccer team gave us all another reason to be proud to be, Amer proud to be American. Uh, the, uh, their performance uh, on the field was, um, was terrific, uh, and the United States doesn't have the long-established reputation that so many other countries do uh, when it comes to soccer, uh, but I think they performed admirably. Uh, the one thing that I will say is, um, and somebody raised this in a meeting that I was at earlier today, that, uh, you know, it's not too hard to imagine that maybe in uh, 2030, for example, there might be a 
U.S. men's national soccer team that comes to the White House to celebrate an achievement of some kind. Uh, and I suspect that when you're talking to those players that they may hearken back to being 8 or 10 or 12 years old and having watched the 2014 men's national team. Uh, and that they'll remember the performance of people like Tim, Hi Tim Howard and Julian Green and Omar Gonzalez and uh, Graham Zussi. That, that these players who performed so well this year uh, served as an inspiration to the next generation of American soccer players. Uh, and while um, the, the final score wasn't exactly what they were hoping for, uh, having the opportunity to inspire the next generation of American footballers uh, is quite a legacy, uh, and it's one they should be proud of. Margaret. Thanks. Um, wanted to go back to the economy, <coughs> not okay. surprisingly. Um, so you had said that they aren't constrained by politics, but it is interesting that they're all kind of on the conservative -y leaning side, if you look at them as a group. And I'm wondering, was that by design? Is the president trying to send a signal to Republicans in Congress that he's talking to economists who may uh, share more of a philosophy <coughs> with them, or is it just a total coincidence? Well, it's not a coincidence, uh, I th but I think it's a little different than what uh, you're hinting at. The fact is, many of the ideas that we've already put forward are the kinds of things that have traditionally earned Republican support. Uh, but yet, they have been, uh, time and again, blocked by Republicans. I mean, uh, just two examples of that. The first is increasing the minimum wage. That's something, the last minimum wage increase was signed into law by President George W. Bush. Uh, but yet, we've seen House uh, Republicans in particular uh, block uh, and indicate their strong opposition to increasing the minimum wage. Uh, traditionally, investments in our infrastructure have been strongly supported by Democrats and Republicans in Congress, and uh, the President's put forward a number of proposals to uh, increase funding and increase investment for uh, our nation's infrastructure, and Republicans have opposed them. So this is less about convincing uh, or putting forward the kinds of ideas that should appeal to Republicans. Uh, we've already done that, and they've repeatedly blocked them. Uh, I think what the President is interested in is uh, making sure that he is consulting a wide variety uh, of perspectives. There are, there are going to be people on both sides of the aisle that have good ideas, uh, and there are going to be people uh, in the academic field of uh, economics uh, who are going to have good suggestions uh, for um, creative policy, idea, uh, policy ideas that can move our economy forward. And the President wants to make sure that he's consulting uh, you know, a wide variety uh, of experts and people who come at this from a wide variety of perspectives uh, to, uh, to, to have a, an intellectual discussion with them about some of their ideas. And again, some of this is not just about the policy ideas they may have. Some of this is also about um, identifying some broader trends in the economy and looking for ways that we can capitalize on those trends by making uh, key investments. You know, one example of this would be in the, in the field of technology. Uh, there are a lot of uh, advancements and innovations in the field of technology that have much broader implications for our economy. And so the question is, can we uh, capitalize on one of the, uh, the consequences of, those, of these rapid changes uh, in a way that leads to uh, a significant economic benefit for uh, middle class families and small business owners all across the country? Them. Usually it takes three to make a trend. This is two. Are we going to see this in a couple of weeks? Will we see these economist lunches continuing at least through Labor Day? Should we expect more, a lot more of these? Uh, I don't know of, uh, of another one that's on the schedule right now, but if we add one to the schedule, uh, we'll let you know. I, um, but the thing I would want, the impression I would want to leave you with, though, is that the President is having these kinds of conversations on a pretty regular basis. And whether it is a formal lunch with a group of economists, uh, you know, or somebody else who uh, happens to be on the other end of the phone with the president or somebody who comes into the Oval Office for a meeting uh, or somebody that the president meets on the road when he's traveling, that he's ready to hear from people uh, who, uh, from outside of Washington, D.C., uh, or outside of the sort of the traditional policymaking sphere uh, for their ideas about, um, about what we can do to expand economic opportunity for the middle class. Yeah, sorry, quick one. Um, okay. The uh, president, I always get this acronym acronym wrong, the Presidential Daily Briefing uh, is uh, on the schedule for the very end of the day, which seems highly unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering, is that like a new thing? you going to go through the entire day before he knows what he needs to know? Or what's, <laughs> the, what's the reasoning for the timing today? Uh, un unfortunately, I think it's for a pretty unexciting scheduling reason, which is that the President uh, telephoned the, uh, King Abdullah this morning uh, during the time in which he'd ordinarily do the PDB, so they moved the PDB to the afternoon. So, Kristen. Josh, thanks. I want to ask you about the crisis uh, along the border. As you know, busloads of migrant uh, families, children, 
were blocked from entering uh, detention centers in Southern California and rerouted um, due to protesters. So a couple of questions. What was the President's reaction? Was that something that you were anticipating? Was that something that you had any sense could happen? Was he surprised? Uh, I haven't spoken to the President about, uh, about those news reports. Uh, you know, what I would say is that uh, you know, what the President has directed uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security to do, uh, and he's asked for funding from Congress to make sure that we can maximize this, uh, is to increase the amount of resources that it's dedicated uh, to dealing with uh, the surge in uh, illegal migration that we've seen at the southwest border. Uh, and so this means adding, um, uh, adding immigration judges, uh, asylum officials, uh, ICE attorneys and prosecutors, uh, and bringing online additional facilities where um, where those who are detained at the border can be uh, held in humane conditions, they can be processed rapidly and efficiently through our immigration system, and if it's determined through that process that there's no legal basis for them to remain in the country, the President would like to have the resources available uh, and for the Secretary of Homeland Security to have the discretion uh, to act quickly to repatriate them. What happened yesterday in Southern California, what's continuing to happen, is that causing the administration to even further reassess uh, its strategy in terms of dealing with what's happening? Uh, no, not at this point. At this point, what we're focused on is making sure that we can ramp up the resources that are necessary uh, to meet this growing need. Uh, and again, this is about balancing our responsibility to, uh, to treat in a humane way uh, those who are attempting to enter this country, uh, but also sending a clear signal to everybody inside this country and to people uh, in other countries who might be contemplating making the very dangerous trip to our southwestern border, that the law will be enforced, uh, and that's exactly what's happening. Secretary John Kerry yesterday in traveling in the region said that uh, the administration would be working with governments in Central America to deal with the root, some of the root causes. There are a lot of root causes, obviously, but including poverty and violence. Can you put any meat on that? What specifically uh, is the administration planning to do? Uh, is there anything that can be done that could help immediately? Yeah, there are some things uh, that can be done that, that the State Department has been working on. I'd encourage you to consult with them for details. There are a number of uh, existing law enforcement relationships that, uh, between the United States and some of these countries uh, where we may be able to leverage some assistance and resources to uh, help these countries deal with what is a growing violent crime problem. Uh, there are also some USAID programs that are in place to try to meet some of the needs of uh, uh, the, you know, the basic day-to-day uh, -day needs of uh, some of these populations uh, to make sure that they're getting, uh, uh, you know, food and access to clean water and some of these other things. So, you know, making sure that those resources are ending up in the right place uh, can try to at least reduce some of the desperation that people in, in these countries are so obviously feeling. And just finally, Josh, some advocate, advocacy groups say that this is not an immigration issue. It's actually a refugee issue. It's a refugee crisis. Does the administration see it that way? Is this a refugee crisis? Well, Chris, in the way that we've described it is it's a, it's a humanitarian situation uh, that requires urgent atten attention. Uh, and that's why you've seen the surge of resources there to make sure that uh, housing facilities can come online so that they can be detained uh, in humane conditions, uh, but also surging uh, enforcement resources there so that, uh, so that uh, you know, while they uh, those who are detained are subject to due process, uh, that this immigration process can move efficiently uh, and a determination can be reached about whether or not they have a legal status or a legal claim to remain in the country. Uh, and if they do not, uh, we're seeking the, uh, the ability of the Secretary of Homeland Security to exercise his discretion uh, about, uh, about repatriating them. I guess the concern for these groups is that if you repatriate them, you're sending them back to these situations that are dangerous and in some cases deadly. Well, this is part of our coordination with uh, the countries that you mentioned, and you know, and usually that means Guatemala, Honduras, and, and El Salvador. Uh, there are repatriation centers that uh, the United States can work with host governments to set up to make sure that, uh, as you point out, that in some cases these kids aren't just sent back into a dangerous situation, but that they actually have some place to go where um, their concerns about their security can at least be addressed. Uh, but this, there's no doubt that this is a multifaceted problem that has lots of, of, uh, of causes. Uh, one of those root causes is misinformation that's being spread by criminal networks down there that are preying upon people who are in increasingly desperate situations. Uh, that's why the other authority that we're seeking uh, is greater ability uh, to punish these criminal 
uh, elements that are preying on uh, desperate people. Uh, that, that is part of, of solving this problem as well. And uh, again, we want to consider the range uh, of abilities that we have to try to uh, meet this need. Okay, move around a little bit. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, uh, on Iraq, uh, in recent days, the Iraqi, a lot of Iraqi government officials have been stepping up calls for the president to launch airstrikes. And there's been an explicit, basically, warning that if the White House doesn't act, they'll increasingly turn to Iran for help. Wondering uh, why the president hasn't uh, decided to launch airstrikes yet, and if he's concerned about us not acting, helping out Iran. Well, the, uh, the guiding principle uh, of the pre that the president is using as he considers this difficult situation in Iraq uh, is focused on the best interests of American national security. And what the president has said is that deploying significant American military resources to try to stabilize the security situation in Iraq will only be successful if that is accompanied by uh, legitimate uh, efforts by the Iraqi political leadership to form an inclusive government that pursues an inclusive governing agenda. Uh, and that is why uh, you've seen senior members of this administration in regular touch with Iraq's political leaders to encourage them to act urgently <coughs> to form a government that actually is inclusive. Uh, as a part of that effort, the Vice President today uh, called Osama uh, Nujafi, who served as the Speaker of the previous session of Iraq's Council of Representatives. Uh, in that telephone call, the President, uh, ex or the Vice President, excuse me, uh, expressed the United States' strong support for Iraq in the fight against ISIL uh, and concern for those Iraqis affected by the current crisis. Uh, the two agreed on the importance of Iraqis moving expeditiously to form a new government capable of uniting the country. Uh, so, you know, we ha we're engaged in a sustained effort uh, to push all of Iraq's political leaders uh, to come together, to move expeditiously to form uh, a new inclusive government, uh, because what will be required to meet the existential threat that's posed by ISIL uh, is a united Iraq, uh, in which all of the citizens of Iraq feel a stake in that country's future. So it's a message to Iraqi's leaders <coughs> right now that if they want uh, U.S. airstrikes, that they have to follow through and form that unity government and change how they act or uh, the president will act? Uh, I think the message might be slightly more direct, which is that if Iraq intends to successfully confront the threat posed by ISIL, it will require uh, a united Iraq to do so. And the nation of Iraq will only be united uh, if there is a unified government that is representative of Iraq's diverse population. Uh, and that is what will be required for uh, success. The United States will stand with the people of Iraq as they pursue uh, an inclusive government like that. Uh, but they won't be successful if they don't uh, if they don't pursue that kind of inclusive governing agenda. What about the threat from Iran? Uh, you know, the, 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 the idea, there are a lot of uh, folks in Congress as well who are worried that Iran is going to step into the breach in a, more of a foothold in Iraq if we don't act soon. Well, you know, what we have said about that is that, that anyone who seeks to exacerbate uh, the sect sectarian tensions that are already manifest there um, will be acting counterproductively. Uh, and when I say counterproductively, I mean against the interests of the nation of Iraq, but also against the interests of other nations in the region. That an Iraq that's torn apart along sectarian divisions is going to have a destabilizing impact on countries all, all across the region. Uh, and it's because of that analysis that uh, it is our view, and I think it's been a view that's uh, been expressed by others outside the administration as well, that it's in the interest of Iran for Iraq to come together to confront this threat. That uh, a, a destabilized Iraq, again, that is divided along sectarian lines, is not the kind of neighbor that Iran wants. Uh, so I'll, I'll let the government of Iran speak to their own uh, motivations and their own uh, uh, decisions that they make about the application of their military might. Uh, but uh, I think any clear-eyed assessment of the situation um, 
leads one to conclude that, um, that Iraq needs to come together to confront this threat, uh, and that doing so is in the interest not just of Iraq, but of nations around the world. Vicara, you want to follow up? Yeah, I do. Uh, on the Biden call, did the Vice President have any specific suggestions about how to form a government? Who, who mm -hmm. should be leading that government? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any more details to read out uh, other than what I just uh, gave you there, but the, it is the view of this, of this administration that, that Iraq's political leaders uh, need to put the interests of the country first. Uh, and that we can't be in a situation where the United States is dictating to the Iraqi people or even to the Iraq, uh, Iraq's political leadership who should be in charge or who should be getting which positions. Uh, this, what they should be working to do, what Iraq's political leaders should be working to do, uh, is to form the kind of diverse government that will actually reflect the will and aspirations of the Iraqi people. There was a significant turnout for Iraq, uh, for Iraq uh, elections recently. Uh, and it's the President's a, calling power brokers uh, within Baghdad. So, mm -hmm. you know, it would stand to reason that they're talking specifics about, you know, how the government should be formed. Well, it stands to reason that he's talking to people who might have some influence over the ability of Iraq's political leaders to come together uh, and make the formation of an inclusive government a priority. Uh, and that is the, the clear message that the Vice President's sending, okay. both privately and publicly. And then fun, uh, finally, you, you, you and various officials, I believe the President, have described what's happening in Iraq as an existential threat uh, to, to Iraq. But yet you're insisting that the government form more inclusively before USAID, more USAID is forthcoming. Would the President allow Baghdad to fall in the absence of a new government? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, that, that's a hypothetical that I'm not sure I would entertain from here. Uh, I think that, you know, our principal concern when it comes to dealing with this situation is ensuring the safety and security of American personnel in Iraq. Uh, and there's a substantial number of American personnel in Baghdad. Uh, and that was the reason for the announcement uh, earlier this week that the President was deploying additional military personnel uh, to ensure uh, both the safety and security of those American personnel uh, and the ability to uh, uh, extract them quickly if necessary. Uh, but in terms of um, you know, sort of the hypothetical question about uh, what the United States may or may not do well, if it looks like they're pressing from the north, they're pressing from the yeah. west. I mean, this is, and you've described it as an existential threat, it so it's something more than it hypothetical. Well, uh, the 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 um, you know the the, the detailed sort of operational question you're asking about uh, the vulnerability of a, one particular city in Iraq is one that's difficult for me to assess, right? But. Suffice it to say, the reason I call it an existential threat is not just because of the security situation on the ground, uh, but, but, but because of the broader um, conflict that's being played out here. Uh, that what ISIL is doing is they are perpetrating terrible acts of violence, but they're also trying to play upon these old sectarian divisions in an effort to pull the country apart. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that, that ISIL is not um, fighting to take over Iraq. Uh, they're fighting to destroy Iraq. And that's why it's important for Iraq's diverse population to come together. It's why it's particularly important for the political leadership to come together, to place the interests of that country uh, ahead of their own political ambitions. Because if the country doesn't unite and does sort of lapse back into these old sectarian divisions, uh, that is only going to create an environment in which it's easier for ISIL to succeed, to defeat ISIL and to defeat the, um, the threat that they pose. Iraq's Sunni, Shia, and Kurdish populations are going to need to come together uh, and, uh, and stand up to efforts by ISIL or any other extremist organization that wants to play upon sectarian divisions that only pull the country apart. Okay. Zeke? As of Monday, the President authorized some total of about 770 uh, U.S. service members into Iraq. Um, was in various capacities, including combat roles, uh, prepared for combat roles if necessary. What is the, is there a sunset on how long will they be there or are they, are they going to be there indefinitely? And also is there a number, you know, is there a ceiling at which the president won't continue to add more troops? I mean, obviously, clearly the ones in the security, if the security situation continues to deteriorate, he obviously decided he needed to send in an additional 200 on Monday. <laughs> Would he, you know, expand that number to, you know, another 770? Well, again, I, I understand why you would do the math in the way in which you did, but I, I think the details here are really important. Uh, what the President has done is he has sent in some military personnel um, and, uh, in two different stages. 
uh, totaling um, a little under 500 troops that are specifically focused on ensuring the security and safety of American personnel in Baghdad. That is their core mission. The President has said that is his top priority, is to ensure the safety and security of American personnel in that country. Um, and the President is satisfied that based on the, the military deployments that have occurred so far, those two, uh, that at this point, as of today, that we can adequately uh, account for their safety and security. Separate from that, the President has indicated a willingness to deploy up to 300 military personnel to work closely with Iraq security forces to help them assess the conditions on the ground and also to assess the, the capability of Iraq security forces. And uh, that assessment is ongoing. But it's important to also differentiate that assessment and advisory team from troops that would have a direct combat role. Uh, the President has, has essentially ruled out uh, a direct combat role for American military forces at this point. That, that, that tranche of troops that's you know, the, the slightly fewer than 500, <laughs> um, the President's reserving the right to send in more if, if needed, A, and B, just judging by your comments before, that there's no, there's no window by which they, or there's no time frame right now or that the President's envisioning for them to be pulled out that years from now that they can still be there if the security situation in Baghdad is still, uh, is still the way it is now? Well, I, I, again, it's, this is a, what we're seeing is a, is a pretty rapidly changing dynamic environment, so I wouldn't want to speculate about what might happen uh, years from now. Uh, but the, suffice it to say, the President will do what's required to ensure the safety and security uh, of American personnel in Baghdad. Uh, but that is separate from uh, any military effort that may be underway uh, to uh, advise and assist Iraq security forces. Okay. Major. Josh, uh, back to the economists. The President said earlier uh, this month, well, in late June, that he intended to have TPP ready by November. Hope the public can take a look at it. Is part of the conversation today to enlist these economists to support congressional approval of TPP once it arrives? Uh, again, I don't, I don't want to prejudge a conversation that's still ongoing. Uh, but the, pre the President's agenda? Well, I, I think what the President's much more focused on is e this meeting is not about uh, securing their political support for a range of economic ideas. This is a meeting that's about uh, hearing from them based on their observations of the economy, ideas they may have for moving this country forward and expanding opportunity for the middle class. Uh, this is an opportunity for the President to hear from them uh, their ideas, and maybe even some new ideas the President hadn't previously considered uh, that would do really good things for the economy. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't really a, a meeting to build political or le legislative support for one proposal or another. There are some, quite a few free traders among those economists there today. Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with the position on trade that each of these uh, economists has, uh, has adopted. But again, this is not really about uh, legislative strategy. This is more about uh, hearing from experts on the economy uh, about what we can do to uh, expand opportunity for the middle class. Economists when TPP will compare and contrast. Uh, maybe you can do that. You're uh, certainly free to do that. On Ukraine, um, what is the administration's position on the President's decision to end the ceasefire and to carry out, in his words, a forceful effort to liberate cities from uh, Russian-inspired or backed insurgents? Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate that Russian-supported separatists did not abide by the ceasefire uh, or provide the kinds of assurances that would have enabled President Poroshenko to extend the ceasefire. Uh, uh, a unilateral ceasefire uh, doesn't work, uh, at least as a prolonged strategy. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, it only fueled separatist violence uh, and allowed the separatists to make further advances. Uh, so, you know, over the ceasefire's 10 days, we saw numerous incidents of separatist violence and takeovers of border posts. Uh, even as the government of Ukraine, uh, at the direction of President Poroshenko, demonstrated uh, restraint and remarkable patience. So we respect the, Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian government's decision and its responsibility to maintain public order in their country uh, and to protect the population. And we commend President Poroshenko's ongoing efforts to pursue decentralization, constitutional reform, and outreach to the eastern part of the country. Uh, the one thing that's not written down here that I'd also relay is that President Poroshenko has not said that he would uh, no longer consider a ceasefire. Uh, if the separatists are willing to lay down their arms, President Poroshenko uh, is willing to reinstate the ceasefire. What he's doing is he's saying that they're no longer going to uh, uh, abide by a unilateral ceasefire that essentially caused 
uh, Ukrainian troops to withdraw or at least not fire back even when fired upon. So that's the, that's the key difference, and um, I think uh, any reasonable uh, assessment of the situation there would, um, would provide some understanding uh, and some insight into why President Poroshenko made the decision What's that he did. What's the message to Putin as he considers his options now? Uh, I think our message is not dissimilar from one that you've heard before, uh, which is that we and our European and international partners continue to press, press President Putin uh, and Russia to end all support and weapons flowing to separatists, to do more to control the border, to call on separatists to lay down their arms, um, uh, to return the border checkpoints that they hold and to release all their remaining hostages. Uh, conciliatory remarks from Russian officials, including from President Putin, uh, are nothing but double talk uh, if Russia continues to support armed separatists in eastern Ukraine, uh, including through the provision of heavy weapons. So you've heard me say before that um, we welcome the encouraging words from Russian officials, but what we really need to see uh, is concrete action to de-escalate the conflict. Uh, quickly, uh, Governor Perry has invited the President to come to the border when he goes to Texas next week. You made it clear yesterday that's not currently contemplated. That's Why right. not? And are you really going to be comfortable with a situation where the President of the United States, with this ongoing humanitarian crisis and significant policy issue that is alarming people not only in Texas, but obviously now place where you're trying to take these unaccompanied kids. Are you comfortable with the optics of the President going for fundraisers only and not taking an eyeball look himself on the border? Well, we're going to have more details about the President's travel to Texas, and it will include some activities other than just uh, building some support for Democratic candidates for office who are on the ballot in November. The President's traveled to the border uh, both as a presidential candidate and as President. Uh, this President is obviously very attuned to what's happening at the border. Senior administration officials, including the Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, the Secretary of HHS, uh, and even Cecilia Munoz, who works here in the West Wing, uh, have recently traveled to the border region to uh, see firsthand the situation there. Uh, I know that, they, uh, that that group in particular, Secretary Johnson, Secretary Burwell, and, and Ms. Munoz spent some time at Lackland Air Force Base, the facility that uh, HHS is operating there to, to provide a, a humanitarian uh, way to detain individuals who have been uh, apprehended at the border. So this is something that the administration is very, paying very close attention to. The President's getting regular updates uh, on this situation. I think the last thing that I would say is those individuals who are concerned about border security and concerned about the situation at the border, uh, that the most important thing they could do uh, is not offer public invitations, uh, but actually to lend their public support to comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, those people who are focused on border security uh, understand that passing comprehensive immigration reform would allow for a historic investment uh, in our borders. Uh, and that's what one of the many reasons the President has strongly advocated uh, for Congress to make progress on that. Now, unfortunately, we've seen that House Republicans have probably effectively killed that for the year. Uh, but the President's going to do what he can uh, to try to mitigate some of the impact uh, of our broken immigration system. And one of the things that the President uh, ordered earlier this week uh, is DHS to uh, move some of the resources that are currently deployed in the interior uh, along the border uh, to try to meet the need uh, that we're seeing there. Just make sure you the President still has no plans to go to the border. That's what you're telling us. Uh, that's, the, that's the continued plan, but uh, schedules sometimes change, and if they do, we'll let you know. But right now, there's no plan to, to visit the border while he's in Texas. Um, well, I, I wouldn't rule it out until the day of, but, um, but, uh, but our focus at this point is, uh, is uh, to plan to do something else. Okay. Jim. Um, continuing on that uh, yes. theme, if we could, just a minute. Um, besides the ugliness and the rancor that happened at the, in Marietta yesterday, there are some people there who are genuinely concerned that their towns are not able to handle uh, the influx and concerned about their health. There was a quote yesterday from one of the people there, we don't want your unhealthy people coming here making my family sick. What is the government, A, doing to make sure that isn't happening, that the people who are coming across are in fact being screened for <coughs> diseases? And B, um, what, is, what is the government doing to help out towns like McAllen and others who are bearing the immediate brunt of this overwhelming flood of people coming? Well, for details about exactly the kinds of screenings and other processing that's involved with individuals who've been detained at the border, uh, I'd encourage you to check with uh, DHS. Uh, I'll point out that the law does require that the federal government treat these individuals in a humane way, and that's why FEMA has been coordinating the resources of, uh, in some cases, the Department of Defense. I mentioned that there's a, a facility at Lackland. 
uh, resources at HHS who's responsible for managing these facilities and DHS to ensure that we're providing a humanitarian uh, way to detain these individuals. Uh, so there is a plan uh, for, for dealing with those kinds of contingencies. Uh, more broadly, uh, the President has, uh, you know, over the weekend, uh, indicated his desire to seek greater funding from Congress so that we can devote more resources to dealing with this problem at our border. Uh, and that's certainly the kind of assistance that would benefit communities like McAllen uh, that are working very hard to, uh, to deal with uh, the consequences of this surge that we've seen. And then if I could just ask you about yesterday, um, the President at Key Bridge called upon, uh, again was trying to go, is saying that he must go around Congress, calling upon the public in general to be on his side and pressure Congress to work for more funding for infrastructure. He's frequently done that and is doing that again. Are, is the White House concerned, is the President concerned that with now his poll numbers so low, with less and less support, in fact today a new poll saying that he may be the most unpopular president uh, since World War II. Um, is he worried that he's still able to do that? Does he still have the chops to call on the public to, to back him? There's no doubt that the president has uh, the leadership and stature necessary uh, to call upon the American public to rally around the kinds of ideas that are in the best interest of the country. Uh, the president's going to continue to do that. Uh, and it's, what's important to remember here is it's not just the power of the presidency, it's the power of these ideas that have the potential to significantly benefit uh, our economy broadly, but also middle class families more specifically. Uh, it's also uh, indicative of the power that's wielded by citizens all across this country, that they do have uh, within them, based on our system of government, the ability to bring pressure on their elected representatives to actually act in the best interest of the country. Uh, and, you know, the president, you know, whether it's uh, common sense measures that would make it harder for an, in, an individual who shouldn't have a gun to get one, uh, or common sense measures that would address some of the problems of our broken immigration system, uh, that ultimately getting these kinds of changes through uh, Congress uh, are going to require the, uh, the active engagement of citizens. Uh, and the President, uh, you know, as recently as his commencement address at the University of California, Irvine, uh, talked about the important role that citizens have to play in our democracy, that our democracy is not just about politics and politicians, it ultimately is about the needs and desires uh, and, uh, uh, and engagement uh, of our citizens. Uh, and I think you're going to hear the President talk more uh, about his, um, you know, as he tries to uh, motivate and mobilize Americans in support of uh, a set of policies that, uh, that that, that aren't inherently partisan. Uh, rather, these are policies that are inherently uh, in the best interest of our economy, and that's why we should, uh, we should see Democrats and Republicans in Congress coming together to support them, in the same way that we're seeing Democrats and Republicans across the country come together in support of these ideas. We see Democrats and Republicans indicate across the country, not in Congress, but across the country, uh, indicate their support for raising the minimum wage. We've, uh, you've heard me say many times, probably too many times, how Democrats and Republicans all across the country, outside of Congress, uh, have come together in support of, of common sense immigration reform. Uh, we need to see that kind of common sense bipartisanship that exists uh, in communities all across the country actually manifest itself inside the halls of Congress. If we did, uh, the country would be in a better place. Okay, Michelle. There have been confirmed cases of swine flu among these undocumented, uh, I mean, sorry, unaccompanied minors. And how big a concern is that for the, the way uh, that I'm not aware of that, but that is, uh, uh, for questions about that, I'd encourage you to check with uh, DHS and HHS. How big a concern is that for the White House that, that something like that could be present and whether, you know, most importantly, whether the resources are even there at this point to deal with something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, there are significant resources that are being applied. Uh, to deal with the wide range of challenges that have been posed by this surge uh, that we've seen at the southwest border. Uh, and that includes resources from HHS, uh, research, resources from uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and even resources from FEMA that are mobilized uh, to deal with this effort, both in terms of uh, ensuring that we are uh, providing the basic humanitarian needs uh, that are required for these individuals, uh, but also making sure that we have the resources to enforce the law. Uh, we're going to do both of those things. Uh, and we're we certainly do all of that mindful of the impact that this is having on local communities along the border. Uh, and we certainly, uh, from uh, in terms of the federal government, want to make sure that we're applying these resources in a way 
uh, that it reflects the needs of, uh, uh, of, of those populations as well. Is the situation prepared enough to handle something like that? If, if several cases or, or there was a need for some kind of quarantine or something like that, I mean, mm -hmm. you feel that yeah. the, the preparation well, is already there. I, I think you're jumping ahead to uh, to, a, to a hypothetical. What I can tell that's you is what that preparation is. I mean, sure, and that's why that's why we're we've uh, applied significant resources to address this problem, and it's why uh, the president has asked for additional funding to make sure that we have the resources on hand to deal with it and. Uh, again, we've seen both Democrats and Republicans speak out uh, about their concerns uh, about this situation. Uh, hopefully we'll see Democrats and Republicans lining up together to support legislation that would make sure we have the resources available to deal with the situation. Yeah, on, on middle class issues um, and equal pay for equal work, whenever these numbers come out concerning the White House, it, it keeps coming up repeatedly that the metric that the White House cites for there being a gap nationwide is also there at the White House. And the, the White House's response is continually that, you well, know, you, just, you, as a, just as a factual point before you can continue on this, right? The, the, the statistic that's cited about the country uh, is about 70, 70, 77 cents on the dollar. Right. And here at the White House, White House, it's 88 cents on the dollar, right? So the White House is doing appreciably better than the country is more broadly. But we still have more work to do at the White House. There are a lot of ways to evaluate pay, pay equity, well, right? You, you know, the White House response, of course, is when you look at the numbers for equal pay, equal work, which should be at the heart of this, it is equal. So do you mm -hmm. think that that comparison, then, is one that should not be made using the averages, whether you apply it to the country as a whole, as a whole or to the White House? Right. I think that there are a variety of measures to try to get at um, whether or not uh, uh, workers are receiving equal pay for equal work. Uh, you can look at whether individuals who hold the same title make the same uh, salary. Uh, that's certainly the case at the White House. There are a variety of examples of this. Uh, you know, to, to choose two, uh, the senior advisor to the president, Dan Pfeiffer, who is a man, uh, is paid the same salary that the president's senior advisor, Valerie Jarrett, is paid. So there is uh, equal pay for equal work that uh, is demonstrated here at the White House. Uh, I'd point out that uh, of all of the departments here at the White House, there are 22 different departments, uh, more than half of them are run by women. So there are women in senior positions who are being paid uh, according, uh, in line with those, uh, with those senior positions. Uh, that is also another way to sort of evaluate uh, one's commitment to pay equity. Well, let me tell you one last, and what I think in some ways might be the most important way that one can demonstrate their commitment to pay equity. Uh, there's paycheck fairness legislation that is sitting in Congress right now that's being blocked by Republicans. Uh, the President is strongly supportive of the Paycheck Fairness Act. The President has signed an, an executive order essentially applying the principles of the Paycheck Fairness Act to federal contractors. That's as much as he can do using his executive authority. He thinks that these rules should apply to workers throughout the private sector. Uh, and right now they would apply to workers throughout the private sector if it weren't being blocked by Republicans. But, but the question is more specific. If, if that average doesn't necessarily represent equal work for equal pay, is it really fair to say that in America it's 77 cents to the dollar, mm -hmm. uh, female to male? Mm -hmm. I, uh, again, what I would say is that there are a variety of metrics that can be consulted to evaluate whether or not, uh, uh, whether or not equal uh, work leads to equal pay. Uh, there you can cite a statistic like that that would indicate that the country has quite a ways to go in order to ensure pay equity for uh, private sector workers. Uh, I think you could use that statistic to indicate that the White House uh, has some improvement to make uh, on, along that measure as well. But if you consider other measures, like at the White House, that um, the people who have the same title make the same amount uh, and that essentially they get equal pay for equal work, uh, there's no question that that's the case. Can I okay. Can I uh, sure, Wendell, go ahead. I'll come back to you. The Post report on this story indicated the president really hasn't made any progress on gender pay equity in the since since he take since he, since his first year in office. Mm -hmm. So how is it that he is able to be so critical of uh, of the private sector and of Republicans for not uh, following in in what he would like to call his footsteps? Yeah. Well, I'd say that uh, again for two ways. One is that if you look at the metrics, the White House performs significantly better than the private sector does. But it's not improving along that metric. Well, but it's, it's already a lot better than the private sector. And the question you asked me was, how can the President demonstrate that the private sector needs to do better uh, when the White House isn't doing better? The White House does do better than the private sector does. But it's not improving. Uh, you're right that there's more work that needs to be done. The President remains committed to that work. What we would like to see for people all across the country uh, is we would like to see a, a Paycheck Fairness Act passed. 
uh, right now that's being blocked by Republicans. Uh, that wouldn't just guarantee fair pay uh, for people in government. It would guarantee uh, fair pay for workers all across the country. This is uh, the, the, the other point I think that I want to make that I've found particularly persuasive in talking about this issue uh, is that this isn't just a woman's issue, right? This is, we're not just talking about uh, fair pay for women. Uh, many of these women uh, are married. Uh, and they have husbands who I think are pretty uh, interested in making sure that their, uh, that their spouse is getting paid a fair wage. Uh, there are a lot of fathers across the country who are looking at this issue, and they certainly want to make sure that their daughters who are showing up to work every day are getting paid uh, a fair wage as well. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a family issue in the eyes of the president. Uh, there is no doubt that there is more that we can do to improve our record here at the White House, but when compared to the private sector, uh, our, our record stands pretty strong. On another issue, for a while after yesterday's game, this was on Wikipedia, Tim Howard identified as Secretary of Defense. <laughs> I don't know if the White House had anything to do with that. And what's your reaction to the 3,000 plus yeah. signatures on the White House blog, yeah. uh, We the People? calling for Reagan National Airport to be named after yeah. Mr. Howard. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I can't claim credit for that brilliant idea that was manifested on, on Wikipedia. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> I don't have any personal announcements to make, uh, but I think that even Secretary Hagel would agree with me uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Tim Howard demonstrated an ability to repel uh, an opponent's attacks uh, with remarkable uh, courage and bravery and athleticism yesterday. Okay. Mara. I have a uh, Iraq question and a highway trust fund question. Um, on Iraq, you've sent this message repeatedly and very clearly that, they ha that in order to succeed, they have to form an inclusive government. How would you assess the Maliki's government response to your repeated um, requests? Is he rejecting this idea? It doesn't seem like he's making any effort to, to move in that direction. Well, right now it's not, up it's not just up to Prime Minister Maliki. There is, under the Iraqi constitution, there is a process for forming a new government. Mm -hmm. Certainly the, the uh, incumbent prime minister, you might call him, uh, will have, a, have uh, something to say about how that process moves. Uh, and what we are seeking is we're seeking all of Iraq's political leaders to assume a, a leadership role, to put the interests of the nation of Iraq ahead of their own political ambition and make sure that there is a government in place that can unify the country in the face of this uh, threat that's posed by ISIL. What kind of response are you getting from those leaders? <clears throat> well, based on the fact that those leaders uh, met yesterday, uh, that they were urged to act uh, promptly to form a new government, but yet they walked away without an agreement is an indication that that process is not off to a good start. They have indicated that they're going to meet again next week, uh, and we hope that when they do, uh, that they will take the advice of uh, not just the Obama administration, but interested countries around the world who are urging them to act quickly and expeditiously to form a government that's inclusive uh, and that can confront the, the threat that's posed by ISIL. On the Highway Trust Fund, I know you're on record as opposing uh, increase in the gas tax, but there is a bipartisan proposal in the Senate. Uh, Corker and Murphy have this idea of raising the gas tax but <coughs> making it revenue neutral so it wouldn't be a tax hike net. Mm -hmm. um, are you open to that idea? Well, what we think is the best way for uh, replenishing the Highway Trust Fund is, is along the lines of the proposal that the President put out, right? That, that we can close uh, loopholes that benefit the wealthy and well-connected, and that would raise ample revenue to replenish the Highway Trust Fund and make the kinds of investments that wouldn't just benefit those companies that benefit from those tax breaks, but would benefit all Americans. That's, a better, that, that's, a, better, that's, a, better use of, uh, that's a better use of our funds, uh, of taxpayer funds, uh, and it is... Uh, a, it's, it, it makes good policy sense. Uh, it also is the kind of thing that should earn support from Democrats and Republicans. There's plenty of reasons for small businesses who don't benefit from many of those tax breaks, but would benefit from uh, uh, you know, a wider highway or a new intermodal transportation facility. So the deadline's approaching, and that idea is not going anywhere. So I'm just wondering, there are alternatives out there, and I'm asking you about one of them. Well, uh, I don't have a specific reaction to the number of, of proposals that have been uh, floated. Um, this bipartisan well, proposal I'm asking yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we'll, we'll evaluate the proposals as they make their way through the legislative process. Um, but what, we're, you know, what we are focused on right now is two things. One is um, doing what I try to do, which is to appeal to the uh, wisdom, of, well. wisdom of members of Congress <laughs> in this proposal, uh, but also to uh, remind uh, members of Congress that the economic consequences for allowing the trust fund to expire uh, would be dire. 
the White House is still opposed to an increase in the gas tax. Well, I think what I would say is that what the White House is supportive of, I'm an optimistic person, as is the President, uh, what we're supportive of is the proposal that we've put forward. If there are other people that have other ideas, uh, we'll certainly evaluate them as they move through the process. Uh, but we've been very clear about, uh, about what we support. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Justin. Um, I wanted to go back to, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, go ahead, Justin. I've forgotten Ann twice now, and I apologize, Ann. I'll come right back to you after this. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I just want to ask about Israel real quickly. Uh, Senator Rand Paul has been kind of pushing this bill that would eliminate aid to the Palestinian Authority after uh, the killing of the three Israeli teenagers. Uh, he says their decision to form a government with Hamas means the U.S. should cut off aid. Um, so I'm wondering both what your reaction to the bill is, if that's something that the President would veto, and um, less concretely, whether there's been a reevaluation of U.S. aid to the Palestinian Authority, both in light of the killings and in light of uh, their joining of a government with, uh, with Hamas. Right, right. Well, uh, we have not, at this point, uh, considered that. Uh, I haven't seen Senator Paul's legislation. Um, what we are focused on in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the killing of these Israeli teenagers that we have condemned pretty clearly uh, is urged both sides to not allow the situation to spiral into uh, an even uh, a worse outbreak of violence. That there remains some ongoing coordination between the Palestinian Authority uh, and the Israeli government, and we hope that that continuation, that that cooperation will continue. Uh, when it comes to reconciliation between um, the Fatah Party and uh, uh, and Hamas, uh, what we have done is we've drawn a distinction uh, between uh, the reconciliation between those two parties uh, and the independent technocratic government uh, that is headed by. Prime Minister Abbas that does not currently include any members of Hamas. Uh, that's an important distinction. Um, we have said that we will uh, assess the interim government based on its composition uh, and its policies uh, and its actions. Uh, and again, right now, there are no Hamas members in, in that government. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we're going to continue to urge both sides uh, to cooperate, quite frankly, because we believe it's in the interests of both sides to cooperate to try to calm tensions on both sides, even in, uh, in the face of, uh, of some terrible violence that we've already seen there. Okay. And I'm going to give you the last one. Thank you. I, I, I'm still confused on the pay equity. If this has been a s signature issue of the President mm -hmm. for six years, mm -hmm. and he can't even bring his own staff into a, a closer alignment, is 100 percent pay equity simply impossible? Well, I think. Uh, that I think this is a difficult policy challenge because there are a variety of reasons uh, why this gender gap exists, right? That there are a, a variety of, uh, of influences uh, that contributes to uh, some of this pay gap that we see. Uh, so this is a difficult problem to address. But is it but, solvable? Uh, but the question is, um, are we going to try to solve it or not? Uh, and the President has done a number of things to try to solve it. You'll recall the very first <laughs> bill that this President signed when he took office was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. He's going to push for Congress to act on the Paycheck Fairness Act. He already signed an, uh, an executive order uh, mandating that the, that the principles of the Paycheck Fairness Act uh, apply to federal contractors. So the President is certainly pushing on this policy initiative, uh, and it's something that we're aiming for. But the staff that he hires and pays for six years, he still couldn't do it. Well, I, again, it depends on how you want to want to calculate that, right? That you have that there are 22 departments here at the White House and more than half of them are run by women. Uh, and that when there are women in senior positions, they're paid uh, the same amount as their, as their counterparts. We've seen uh, high profile women here in the West Wing get promoted over the course of the last year. My colleague Amy Brundage was promoted to be Deputy Communications Director. Uh, my colleague uh, Katie Byrne Fallon was, was previously the Deputy Communications Director and is now running our legislative affairs operation. So uh, we've seen, seen women here in the West Wing uh, rise through the ranks into leadership positions. Uh, and when they rise through the ranks, we see that they are, uh, you know, paid fairly in terms of they're receiving their equal pay for the equal work uh, in the same way that their male counterparts are. Mentioning 77 cents per dollar, by that measure, the White House still can, can't reach 100%. Well, uh, by that measure, the White House is doing significantly better than the private sector is. And we're encouraging the private sector uh, uh, to, to get better. Uh, we're certainly going to make some efforts here at the White House to improve on our standing. Uh, I wouldn't hold up the White House as the, uh, as the perfect example here, 
Uh, but we are an example of an organization uh, that is making a, an, an effort and enjoying some success uh, in making sure that there are women uh, who, are, uh, who get equal pay for equal work uh, and women who have an opportunity to advance their careers uh, here at the White House. And I think our record, when judged by that standard, uh, holds up very, very well. April, I'll give you the last one. Thank you. Civil Rights Act anniversary yes. today. Yes, good. I'm glad you asked me about that, so I'm glad I stuck around. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a little news here. Later today, we're going to have a statement from the President on this, uh, so you'll be able to quote him. You won't have to rely only on my eloquence up here. Is it coming out, or is it going to be on paper? Uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a statement on paper. Uh, the President earlier this year, though, gave a very compelling speech uh, when he was last in Austin, Texas, uh, at the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library, uh, where he spoke uh, at a civil rights summit that was attended by several other presidents uh, and marked the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights uh, Act. Um, there are a number of other senior administration officials who are taking part in uh, activities that will commemorate this important anniversary. Um, Secretary uh, Duncan, Secretary Perez, uh, and the Attorney General, uh, Eric Holder, uh, are at Howard University today participating in a ceremony. Uh, and Secretary Fox is down in Louisiana uh, participating in a, a ceremony uh, with uh, Mayor Landrieu uh, to mark the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act. So there are a number of activities, but uh, in terms of a comment from the President, we'll have something on, uh, on paper later this afternoon. As you look back 50 years uh, to today, What's the work that's left to be done that this president thinks that he could do in his remaining years here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the president would probably have something more eloquent to say about this than I would, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, I would encourage you to definitely look at that speech that he gave back in April. Uh, but you know, this president believes that when uh, on a variety of, of issues that there's a basic humanitarian standard that should be applied. Uh, that people uh, should not be discriminated against because of the color of their skin, where they come from, uh, or who they love. Uh, and that is a principle that this president has uh, uh, tried to live up to, uh, and one that he has tried to make progress uh, in pursuit of. Uh, there clearly is more work that needs to be done uh, to live up to that standard in all aspects of governmental policy, but in all aspects of our uh, society. Uh, but this president's going to keep pushing. Uh, but there's no doubt that, um, that somebody like Lyndon Johnson, if he were still here with us, uh, would, would be looking at the world uh, or this country as it exists right now, uh, and I think would be remarkably impressed uh, at the conviction uh, and dedication of the American people to make as much progress as we have uh, in the last 50 years. Uh, but that progress would not have been possible without somebody like President Johnson. And so uh, today's the day not just to remember the signing of that piece of legislation, uh, but remember the man who pushed so hard to bring it to his desk so he could sign it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.